So hi there, guys. Welcome back from lunch. Um, as he said, I am Carl. I am the CTO at 2600 Hertz. And um, I'm just going to kind of go over a little bit about what we've been doing and give you a little bit of a heads up about uh, what's coming up. So we'll go over some of the technical milestones that we've managed to achieve, the reseller milestones, the end user milestones. And then I want to talk to you about Kazoo 4.0 which some of you might have heard a little bit about, um, but I'm going to solidify the, the pillars that's going to bring that version about. So with the technical milestones, well, we've been extremely busy. Uh, we've had uh, the record number of commits and authors. Uh, and as you can see, we've touched a couple files. <laughs> we've also fixed 25 spelling mistakes. So that's a, that's a plus. <laughs> but we've been busy in both Kazoo and Monster UI. In Kazoo, uh, we've added quite a number of uh, additional features. These aren't all apps. Uh, but for instance, uh, Luis has committed uh, what's known as the Pusher app. Uh, what that application will do is it will um, send a notification to an Android or an Apple device to wake up a soft phone when a call comes in. Camellia will hold on to the invite until the registration happens and then continue the call. And so that would let you create a soft phone that doesn't actually have to run continuously on a mobile device, thereby draining the battery, and uh, et cetera. Um, and you could use this for other things as well. Obviously, it's written for Android and um, uh, to connect to Android and Apple's push notifications. But you could wake up other devices as well, uh, for instance, perhaps WebRTC. Um, we also very recently, uh, from the other Luis, uh, committed network maps. Uh, so network maps uh, is our uh, endeavor to support some of the more complicated networks that you guys are deploying into. And a lot of you, or a couple of you, have various SIP interfaces to get out to various VLANs and other elements on the network. And network maps will look at where the phone came from and then choose a SIP interface based on the IP range. Uh, so for instance, if your phones are coming in on VLAN 1, then we won't send it out SIP interface 1. We would send it out SIP interface 2, for example. Uh, Pierre up there has done uh, an amazing, uh, pretty interesting work with bash completion. So I, I just would like to show you this, because it's pretty impressive. So here's my terminal. And yep, you guys can see that. I'm going to type SUP and hit tab twice. And you can see it auto-completed all of the maintenance commands. And I'm sure that that's going to be useful for the system administrators up there. And if I continue this, it will then auto-complete the, uh, the individual commands within the maintenance module. And then if I am confused about what the, uh, the arguments to that command might be, I do it one more time. And it tells me it takes a number. And this is actually part of our build system. And I'll talk a little bit more about this. But uh, what it's actually doing is it's actually every time we compile and create packages, it's looking at the code, analyzing the, uh, the, the, the maintenance modules themselves, and creating the bash completion from that. So simply adding functions shows up in the bash completion. And that's now part of the RPMs. So the next time you guys update, your RPM will install the new bash completion file to the system. And you just if you don't already have the bash completion RPM installed, you do that as well. We've also had uh, contributions and done some additional work with some of our uh, community members to start adding patch support. So that's the HTTP verb. Uh, and what that lets you do is instead of pulling the entire document down, making a modification and storing it back, you can simply send up the element that you would like to change, which makes everyone's life a lot easier if you're just doing little changes. Um, the patch support isn't across the board right now. Uh, a number of modules uh, support it, uh, and we're exp and expanding that in the API set. Uh, some of you also are probably aware of Konami. Uh, for those of you who are not, uh, well, first off, the name is from the Konami codes, which were the cheat codes in video games from way back in the day. So these are the cheat codes into your phone. Uh, and what it does is it listens for DTMF events in band, in a, well, not in band, but in a call, and actually executes some trigger. It uh, executes something we called the meta flows. And those can do things such as transfer, put calls on hold, uh, any number of in-call actions, start uh, a call recording, for instance. And the Konami codes can also be triggered not just from DTMF in the call, but also from the APIs. So that means that 
from the API, you can trigger a Konami code to perform a transfer, do a call recording, things like that. Recently, we also started adding to the core um, a, a new library called Kazoo Documents. Um, I would like to rename it Objects. That's still up for debate. <laughs> but the, uh, what this is doing is this is an abstraction, um, accessors and setters for all the JSON documents that we store in BigCouch. What this lets us do is it gives us a unified place to go and look not only and do modification if there's some kind of data uh, manipulation that we need to do. For instance, uh, we had an issue where Monster UI was storing the time zone as the string inherent by accident. And so we were able to readily fix that in Kazoo Documents because anytime we requested the time zone, we just negated the string inherit. Um, but this also means that this will be a good place to go to look and see what type of elements and properties and things are on the document and normalize both the retrieval and the uh, setting of those, those elements so that uh, we can ensure that we keep uh, clean data in the database. We also, uh, Peter, has added another core library called Kazoo Ledgers. Uh, Kazoo Ledgers uh, is uh, how, when we do billing and other elements, uh, we keep a running ledger in the MODBs. And Kazoo Ledgers is an abstraction of that. But what's really interesting to you guys is this is also exposed now on the API so that you can create your own ledgers of any arbitrary name. So for instance, you might create a ledger for support credits or you know, anything else that you would like to track in the system. And using the APIs, you can associate uh, consumables against an account. James Aminetti has also committed uh, something called WebSocket Sequence Generator. Or, sorry, Web Sequence Generator. Um, what this does is this lets us instrument code in a way that gives us an output that you can then put into a, uh, the web sequence generator online, which is just an online service, and it'll generate a ladder diagram. Uh, he used this primarily when he was when we were looking at uh, ACDC, um, and we've used it in some other places. Um, but this lets you take place a call, take the output of the sequence generator, stick it in a website, and you can see the ladder diagram of exactly how it moved through Kazoo. So it's it's a very useful tool for debugging, or if you're creating your your own um, uh, modules. Um, and also, you know, there's been a number of new call flow modules that have been committed. Um, from all of the various community members here and the corresponding crossbar modules that it came in with that. And of course, I'm only summarizing here. As we saw on the previous slide, uh, there's been a lot of changes to the code, so I won't have time to go over them all. <laughs> and most exciting, and what Darren has been talking about and we've been showing you here as well, is the WebSockets. And so WebSockets are, are finally getting to that point where you have the real-time integration points into the system in order to build very interesting applications. Uh, you know, obvious things like an operator panel, um, but less obvious things as well. Uh, they've been used uh, by Luis here to indicate the fax status uh, and things of that nature. So uh, the screen pops would be another good example of how these could be used. So let's go socket all the web. We've also done a lot of work for Erlang. Um, just being able to support the next version, and obviously we're skipping a version since we're a bit behind on that. Uh, so we'll be jumping probably to 17.5 uh, at the moment anyway. And you might have also noticed that the pull request and the build system themselves have been, instrument, or have been extended cons uh, with um, Travis uh, to run Dialyzer. And so what Dialyzer is, for those of you who don't know, it's a static code analysis system which just it checks the quality of the code. If we have uh, some function and we say we expect numbers and somebody sends a string, Dialyzer says, hey, you know, that's not going to work. And so this lets us catch uh, some of the grievous coding errors and some of the more complicated ones as well really early on. Uh, we've also been doing a lot of work because Dialyzer relies on the specs and normalizing the specs and coming up with standards to ensure that all of the functions have proper and, and uh, specs so Dialyzer can do its job. For those of you who've been compiling lately, you might have noticed that the make command is also uh, checking the, the syntax of all the views and ensuring that those will be able to be properly loaded into the database. Uh, a couple of times there's been, for instance, a comma missing or something, and the view doesn't get updated when you guys run the migrate command. So now the make compilation will actually check that. Another really interesting one by Pierre, actually both those are by Pierre, uh, was the addition of xref checking. So this is a built-in tool to Erlang. What this does is it checks to make sure that you're not calling a non-existent function. 
Uh, so if you typo a function, uh, leave a U off account or something, as has happened in the past, this will complain very loudly. And of course, we've had unit and proper tests in the system. Uh, they haven't been part of an automated build. Uh, we just periodically ran them. They're now part of this uh, Travis integration that we've uh, been working on. And so the unit test and the proper test run regularly. And if you've been paying attention to a lot of the uh, new commits that we've been making, they've been adding a considerable number of tests as well. And so just to kind of show you guys here what that looks like, and I don't mean to pick on this particular one. It just happened to be the first one on the thing. But this is a pull request that was submitted. And uh, this is telling us that this particular build has failed. And you're not really sure why, but if you come down here and click on details, what you see is the output. And this is, if you notice the scroll bar here, quite a lot of data. But at the very bottom of it is the reason that it failed. And here we can look that um, the dialyzer is complaining that this thing says that uh, somewhere it's going to use OK, comma, action, and they're giving it OK. So that can never match. That would crash. Right? And it could be just that that spec is wrong. Like I say, I haven't actually dug into this. But these tests run every time you commit a, a pull request. Uh, and we've made it a policy of the, uh, of the office now that we cannot accept a pull request until the test has completed and passed. And so this is helping us uh, maintain our code quality uh, just from the, um, directly from an automated way. So. We have everything in Camellio's source tree. Uh, we announced that we had started that and we're almost finished with that last year. It's definitely there this year. Uh, we've been working out of it directly. As a matter of fact, you'll notice there's been no new changes to the Kazoo Camellio GitHub uh, repo. Uh, and we intend to stop shipping the Camellio RPMs uh, and switch over to using the, uh, the direct packages from that project uh, when we do deployments and updates. Uh, so we'll be making that change. And we're also preparing to move to uh, Camellio 4.3.2, where we've done a significant amount of work. Again, Darren hinted at this a little earlier, but in our own module there. So we've, we've improved the performance of the, um, of the uh, Kazoo module uh, quite a lot. Uh, we've been working uh, with the uh, Camellio team. Luis has been doing a tremendous amount of work on that. And that's let us achieve uh, the, some of the... Uh, um, performance boost that, uh, that Luis will actually be talking about a little bit later. And in this version as well, all of the queries that we do to Kazoo are no longer uh, blocking. Uh, those are using uh, Camellio's asynchronous capabilities in order to make those, those queries. Another big one that gave us a huge performance boost was we used to, when the registrations would come into eCall Manager Registrar, they would be incomplete in Kazoo terms. Uh, they were all the SIP information, but they didn't have what we called the supplemental parameters. An uh, uh, easy example would be to send out email notifications when the registration is lost. That's actually part of the parameters that's stored in, in the registrar. So what it would happen is, for the first registration that would come in, it would get stored in eCall Manager. eCall Manager would detect that it was the first registration, issue a query to get those supplemental parameters, and then add them to that, that stored contact. Now we've moved that so that when, the, um, when, it, uh, when uh, Camellio publishes the registration success, to do that, it would have had to have queried Kazoo in order to get the credentials, of course, since it's authenticating it. So when it got those credentials, it also gets the supplemental parameters and then passes them along on the reg success. Uh, so that removed a query response uh, for, uh, for the first of all registrations, which actually uh, improved the system quite a lot. So obviously, um, you saw the free switch guys here. There were some questions as well about uh, 1.6. Yes, we are moving to 1.6. And all of our commits and uh, mod kazoo is in the free switch source tree. Uh, it's been there for a little while, but they are ready and we're ready. And so we're going to start doing the migrations. Uh, there is one caveat to this. Um, as you might have heard as well earlier, um, they are now preferring uh, Debian. Uh, and so we're coming up with migration paths to provide means for you guys to switch your media servers, which were sent to OS, into free switch. Uh, we've got a lot of ideas how we can make that as painless as possible. Um, but as we start to migrate these systems, we would like to start moving your media servers to Debian. Uh, we'll also start providing Debian packages for everything that we build as well. 
so that if you would like to unify the entire um, platform uh, on that uh, Debian OS, uh, then you'll be able to. So obviously this opens the door to the amazing video services that we saw them demo here. Um, and with, the, um, with all the uh, web sockets, web hooks, and, and configuration APIs as well, uh, you'll be able to build uh, very interesting uh, video services from that. Uh, they've also done a tremendous amount of work, uh, as Mike had mentioned, with Opus. Um, they've done a lot of WebRTC work there. Um, they've done some DTMF improvements, and of course, lots of bug fixes on that, on that particular branch as well. Uh, so you should look forward to all of those. So let's talk about some of the reseller milestones that we hit this year. So webhooks, uh, we've actually extended the webhook data significantly. Peter has done a lot of work on this, adding um, a lot, of, lot more events that you guys have been asked for. Uh, we solicited the community. Uh, we got a lot of feedback about what you were looking for, what kind of use cases you had, and uh, what kind of things that you would like to see. And so we've been adding those, and those are coming out. Uh, we've also added some more debugging information to that so that you guys can get more insight into what's going on. Um, a few of you might have run into the fact that um, if your webhook fails more than the configured period of time, we actually disable it uh, to, uh, uh, to avoid trying services that could never reply, or well, not reply, but uh, consume. And there was actually no button to re-enable it on the UI. Uh, so those two features became out of sync. So uh, we've added all those things to it. Um, and we've also improved the look of it. Uh, we're going through and doing uh, UI refreshes and kind of bringing everything uh, into a more unified um, uh, experience as well. We've also done a lot of work with the white labeling. Uh, so some of you might have noticed the DNS helper. I'm not sure uh, if you've been to the, the Monster UI branding app or not. Uh, but the DNS helper, you punch in your, your realm that you would like to white label. It will do DNS lookups, compare them to the things that we would like them to point to, and then tell you which ones are wrong and what you need to do in order to correct it. Uh, so that makes the setup of DNS much, much simpler. <laughs> the other nice thing about this is if we ever need to expand, again, as we add WebSockets and everything else, perhaps if we put that on its own realm um, or domain, then we can add these to the DNS helper and tell you, you know, go check the DNS helper, see if you've got all the correct mappings for those things. Um, of course, there is one caveat, and that is the DNS caches things. Uh, Kazoo will do its best to go back to the, the home server, the, the, the SOA, for the DNS entry. But, uh, you know, some caching might be involved there. If you're doing a lookup, making a change, and looking it up again, it may not take effect immediately. And unfortunately, there's not a lot we can do about that. But if you've got some ideas uh, about maybe a way around that, I'd love to hear from you. Um, you might have also noticed a major app uh, that's Teletype. Uh, that is, uh, anybody here know what a teletype is, by the way? I didn't actually think about that. We <laughs> A couple, yeah. <laughs> so a teletype is an ancient piece of equipment. It's an um, electromechanical device, a keyboard and printer, uh, and the computers used them for a long time. They also were wired into the phone system, and what you typed on one side would print out on the other. And so the teletype app is the new email notification application. Um, but this one is uh, replacing the notify app. Uh, so this is gives you the ability to do complete what you see, what you get emails. Uh, so with WYSIWYG editors and uh, token replacements, you can type out the entire email content that you would like sent, put in your icons or your logos, um, and that is the notification that will be sent out. The system is also um, highly extensible. So you might have noticed we've added a lot more notifications, and we will continue adding notifications as people need them. Uh, that gives you the ability to have notifications uh, go directly to your customer or to your admin or your operations staff so that you know exactly what's going on, new accounts, things like that. Um, the teletype system also lets you direct where those emails go. So you can have them, for instance, a voicemail to email can be configured to both be sent to all the admins of the account that left the voicemail as well as the user the voicemail was for, uh, for instance, if you wanted to do that. Or you could have it... Uh, you could have, for instance, a new account sent to the person who created the account and BCC all the reseller admins. So it gives you a, a tremendous amount of flexibility in branding and white labeling. And we've also uh, almost concluded the, the final work here for the porting manager, uh, which will let you manage the ports in, the, uh, in Monster UI. And so what this does for you is it gives you a unified view into all the accounts to see the port requests that your customers have filed as well. You'll get the email notifications. 
You'll be able to walk them through um, a uh, series of steps, uh, uh, a flow that we've worked with you guys in the community to come up with, and that you can move things, for instance, to pending and it re uh, or accepted, and accepted requires a port date. It gives you a little pop-up. You put in the date, and the customer then knows not only is it accepted, but what the date is. It's listed in their, their view. The ports, the, the port requests as well, are um, grouped uh, by the, the provider, which I think Patrick mentioned a little bit earlier, which helps alleviate the issues with people not submitting the correct ports because they didn't realize that you, know, you need two different port requests if the numbers are with different providers. So it automatically does all of that. And the other big change to the porting manager, which is something that was heavily requested, is that when the port requests are submitted, those numbers become available immediately uh, so that you can create the office uh, using the numbers on the, on, that were in the submitted port request uh, so that you guys can fast track your onboarding processes. Um, one of the next improvements that we'll be making there uh, is what we call temporary numbers, and it'll be an alias. You'll have a number alias for the ported number, and so you create the call flows with the, the number that the port request was for. You forward the number before the port to the alias number, and the system just pretends it's the, it's the completed port. Once the port completes, the alias number is released back to the pool. So that should make your setup very quick and very efficient for your customers. And this is the DNS helper, uh, just showing kind of what I was talking about before, where on the uh, left-hand side, we tell you why we would like this DNS entry. Uh, we show you exactly what it is that we're looking for here, uh, using your white-labeled request that, th that you typed in at the top, the type of record, and where it should go on the side. And the little red triangles are there telling you that, uh, hey, this isn't uh, resolving to the thing that we expect. Uh, we've also written a migration app. So what the migration app allows you to do is take accounts that were created in call flows, in advanced call flows as it's called on Monster UI, and create smart PBX accounts from them. And it does that by going through and using a lot of logic that we've put together to identify this thing looks like an extension, this thing looks like a ring group, this ring group is used in three places, so I, it's just one ring group. Um, identifying, hey, this is probably the main number, and I, Unfortunately, I was going to do all these things live, um, but unfortunately, with the resolution here, they end up in a box that big. <laughs> so I took a bunch of screenshots. By the way, all the screenshots I'm showing you are from my dev server on this laptop. So this is all live and working. Um, but at the completion of this, once you've gone through that wizard of selecting, yes, please do these things, please do these accounts, you are correct, that is indeed the main number, uh, and you hit go, you can convert it to the smart PBX. And then conceivably, you can start giving your customers access to their own accounts and letting them self-manage, which is an excellent capability. And then, as Darren was saying before, uh, we've improved the setup and management of carriers with the Carrier app. Uh, again, giving you more capabilities in managing the priorities of the calls. And we've added the ability to manage dedicated IPs. There's a series of sub-commands that if you have a bunch of dedicated IPs you're offering to your customer, you can assign them all as listeners in the Camellio server, upload them into using the subcommand, put them into the system, and then your customers can grab them out of there automatically and associate them with their account. And then we use that when we route calls out as the outbound proxy. Uh, so if any of you are still using the semicolon fs underscore path equals hack, uh, then you can stop doing that because the system will automatically do that for you. Also, uh, obviously, uh, <laughs> regex continues to be uh, utilized heavily throughout the system, uh, and we've provided a means uh, in the carrier app now where you can test the regex expression, see what's going to match, see what's going to go out to the carrier. Um, so you can type in what you think you want to use, type in the number, hit go, and it says this is what would actually happen as a result of this. And we're starting to roll in what we kind of deem non-technical tasks. Uh, so this is, for instance, the ability in the carrier app to upload the contract you have with that carrier, the expiration date, uh, type in some metadata. It's, it's pretty simple right now, but the idea is that your entire carrier relationship could be managed from this one application, and so we can send you an email notifications when that contract is about to expire, or if you need to reference it, it's all in one place. You don't have to go digging for it. And of course, we've added all the various parameters there. One of the big ones that kept coming up was uh, the ability to do video and audio codec selections there, um, and, and the templates. Uh, which allows you to create um, carriers that are incomplete, 
in some way. So for instance, uh, a reseller might create a, 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 a template for some bandwidth.com or something else like that, some carrier, and uh, put that into their system. Their sub-accounts can then grab that template, fill out the username and password, and you've done all the other work. Uh, you've done all the legwork to make that work for them. So they can create their own contracts if you so desire, and then they just simply put in username and password, and the, it just works. And that prior uh, selection that I look like and it's most complicated looks like this. Uh, so we've got the uh, classifiers on the side, so that's not a hard-coded list. In this case, it's just US toll-free, toll, emergency dispatch, if you can't read this. And then on the right-hand side are the carriers that have been configured to provide that type of service. So these two guys are, are configured to provide toll-free service. And then within toll free, I can then drag and drop to change the, the priority here or turn them off for just that toll free component and still have it on on other classifiers as well. So it's starting to give you a lot of granular control to kind of overcome when a provider might have a particular issue in some area. We've also been doing a lot of work on uh, the debug app. Uh, so uh, you might have seen that uh, it has the reg real time registration information. So that was where we added that back. It also has the SMTP logs in there. So what the SMTP logs are showing you uh, right now is they're showing you the uh, failures for email to fax, which we'll talk about a little later, because those basically go into a black hole when they can't be authenticated, and you have no insight into why. The debugging app tells you why. And we're extending this uh, so all of the emails that leave the system will be logged here. So in the branding app, if you were to configure a template and you wanted to see what it actually looked like when it got sent out, who the resolved addresses were that actually received that email, you'll be able to go into the SMTP logs and take a look and see what the system actually did there. Pierre, uh, again, has done a lot of work, uh, a tremendous amount of work on providing SIP ladder diagrams. Uh, so this is, a, this is a really cool tool. What, what this is actually doing is on each zone in the cluster, it's, it's collecting information obviously uh, the, the SIP information, uh, using HEP. Uh, it can also parse the logs, uh, a lot less efficient. Uh, HEP is a better choice there. Um, but it stores for that zone the information. When you then go into the uh, SIP ladder di uh, diagram tool, it'll give you all the CDR entries uh, that have associated SIP information stored. You click on them. We collect that from all the different zones in the cluster and then we have a, a fancy algorithm to reorder them and put them in the, in the proper SIP order uh, without timestamps. So this lets you see exactly what happened across the entire cluster uh, as a SIP ladder diagram. And we're extending this. Obviously, um, what we would like to really get here as well is in addition to being able to debug the, the SIP information, which is great, but also audio. So uh, give you self-service tools to debug audio quality issues. Uh, and there's a number of ways that we can achieve that that we're working on. Uh, we've also recently added another list to this that gives you the real-time subscription information. So when your your phone subscribes and your, for presence or BLF, then you could come into this, see which phones are subscribed to the users, and because there's been some instabilities, which I'm sure you guys are aware of, this also lets you flush the lights. So if a phone had a stuck status or something else like that, this will give you the ability to clear the light and let it resume from where it was. Uh, and it, the app looks like this for those of you who haven't seen, um, where uh, we're also trying to get to the point where when you look at that registration information, it gives you a breakdown where the phone is, how it connected across the internet, and what it's connected to on your cluster. And we're adding some more information into here. For instance, um, we're trying to get, uh, we're, we're working on adding the um, provider, the ISP on that cloud so that if you were to have an issue or something else like that and you opened up in the registration information and saw, oh, they're all Time Warner, it might be a Time Warner issue. Also uh, requested quite a lot uh, is the ability to change the, um, uh, the Monster UI applications that are available to the sub-accounts. So using this tool, you can restrict what applications the sub-accounts have access to and then you could control how you provide those to them uh, based on your various business models. And probably one of the more, most useful ones here, at least for me, uh, jumping around accounts, is that little pull down up there is giving me a search box and listing the hierarchical accounts from this root level. I can then drill down, find the account that I'm interested in, click on that. It'll masquerade as that account and leave me in this app. So without having to leave Smart PBX, go to account manager, switch to another account, come back to Smart PBX, I can just jump around the accounts very quickly and very, very easily.
So let's talk about some of the end user milestones. Uh, so we've been we've added a lot of language support. Uh, this gives you the ability to add different language prompts there. The call flows now expose it. Uh, and we have um, French, Russian, and Spanish contributions, and we're looking for more if you have a language of your choice there. And the UI pretty much matches that as well. Um, we've also added in the international capabilities what is called the uh, shared dial plan configuration. So every account has uh, can carry a dial plan, and that manipulates the numbers coming and going from it, which is how we do a lot of our integrations overseas. Uh, for instance, adding country codes, things like that. What this allows you to do is create a rule, for instance, for um, all Spanish numbers or something of that nature in a top-level account and then reference it from all the other accounts uh, so that you don't have to duplicate it across the accounts. Uh, so very convenient there. The provisioner. Uh, a lot of you saw this. Um, the, you can now, if the phone is registered, of course, send the SIP notification out to the phone saying, please phone home, check your synchronization with the provisioner, and if the file has changed, go ahead and restart. Well, most phones restart, depends on the phone. Uh, but this also is coded in to do it automatically. So if you were to go into a device, change the name, and hit save, automatically we'll send out a SIP notification to the device. Uh, we haven't come across any devices that reboot while you're in a call, but if you're not in a call, they will then restart and the screen will show up with the name that you typed into the, uh, to the device configuration page. And we've been adding and improving both the basic and advanced features. In Smart PBX, under the Advanced tab on the device, you can now configure BLF keys, uh, both personal parking, parking slots, and presence indications, uh, so, as well as speed dials. Uh, and that information gets pushed out to the provisioner. And again, with the SIP notify, the phones restart, it just shows up. Uh, improvements to the presence in the BLF configuration as well, uh, and I'll go over a lot more detail about those. And we've been working again on the firmware and, of course, the security of it. I missed that on here. We've also done a lot of work for f email to fax. Uh, so this lets you, of course, send an email with an attachment that then gets sent out as a fax. That's where that SNTP component comes from. Because when the system comes in, what we do is we associate the email that it was sent from with a fax box that's configured in the system. So we know the parameters of what the caller ID and all the other elements of how to send that fax out um, are. We also support uh, fax boxes uh, for the entire account now, which was another community request, because uh, initially we just supported it on a per user basis. But when those emails come in, if they come in from an unknown address, then Kazoo just simply ignores it. And that's where it goes into that black hole. And so coming back to the debug app and the SMTP, if you drill down, you'll see that there's um, the ones that are get rejected have errors. If you go into the errors, they tell you exactly why it was rejected. For instance, can't find a match for whatever it came in as. We've also done a lot of work uh, for pickup optimizations. This is something that a lot of people have asked for or uh, repeatedly heard from the community here. Uh, with parking pickup and intercept calls. Uh, so this work is specifically for those that are using the BLF indicators on the phone in order to do those pickups. Uh, what we're doing now is there's a role in Camellio that we call uh, the uh, fast pickup role. And when the uh, indication goes out to the phone uh, in order to trigger the light, we add an additional parameter to it, we just called it the cookie, that lets Camellio know which free switch server it needs to route to in order to fulfill the request when they push the button on the phone. And this alleviates the need uh, to redirect the phone or, or, or fix the phones that come into the wrong free switch server uh, when they attempt to do that. Uh, so in some testing, this has gone from seven seconds to one second in order to retrieve calls from, from parking. So it's very significant. And this is, we're still, uh, working a lot on this for people who are using feature codes directly, like a star something, star three or something like that, just directly from the phone. Uh, and we have a lot of improvements to come from there as well. One of the other things to note is for the intercepts. Uh, we're also working uh, to include in the provisioner the use of the replaces header. Most phones will support the ability to, when you hit the button to answer a ringing phone, send a replaces header on that invite request, which we can then uh, have... Um, uh, free switch directly intercept the call, which means that, as a matter of fact, Kazoo isn't involved in that because that's just SIP signaling. So Kazoo is aware of it, but doesn't actually have to do any processing in order to fulfill that request. 
And that, of course, significantly reduces the amount of time uh, for answering ringing phones, which means you're more likely to grab it, because the longer it takes us to process the feature request to grab the ringing phone, the more likely that it might have gone into voicemail or something else of that nature. So in the presence and omnipresence as well, uh, we've been doing a lot of optimizations there. Presence is a very chatty uh, system, uh, and Omnipresence uh, is probably one of the apps that consumes the most amount of resources right now on large environments. And so we've been working in there to do a lot of optimizations. Uh, we've also added uh, support for soft phones, uh, and we've been working on uh, reliability improvements in there. Uh, for instance, making sure that uh, if a free switch server crashes or disconnects from the system, that there are notifications that go out that flush the BLF indications for calls on that free switch server, because that was one of the, one of the ways that lights would get stuck or continue indicating uh, when, um, when, the, when that happened. Uh, and again, coming back to the self-service and, and debug management, giving you insight into what the system is doing and a point where you can go and if you have a customer who's calling you, you can take immediate action there uh, so that you can you know, keep them happy. And also recently, we've been adding PDF support to a couple of the APIs. Uh, so the first one that has it at the moment is the directories API. Uh, and what this is uh, allowing you to do is you can make requests to Crossbar that will return a PDF of, for instance, uh, the, the calling scheme for a company. So if you were to do a deployment, you could go into a company, uh, you know, set them all up, put the phones out there, click on a button and give them a PDF of all the phone numbers in their account with the associated device names, usernames, things of that nature. And of course, we can put this on all their APIs as well. So there's a lot of interesting things that we can do here in order to help you just dynamically generate documents that you need during an onboarding or even just maintenance. Um, we've also added the simple number search. So this is uh, tied into the Project Phonebook. What this is doing is when you punch in an area code, the system is going back and it is querying for a region to find the switches in that area that have the, the various uh, area codes and, and prefixes, and then showing you where those belong or where they, those reside. So if you're not familiar with an area or you're not sure of what other prefixes are around, if I actually click on those uh, little tags that are there, it'll show me, for instance, that San Francisco has 415, yada, 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 so that I can go into an environment or a location that I'm not familiar with and still find local numbers for those people. And more. So we've done a lot of work on the search API. This is the start of being able to search for things like devices, accounts, based on the account name, the account realm, things of that nature. Uh, it's not full text search yet. Uh, that's still something that's in the works. Uh, but this is letting you find, um, re uh, find the various objects in the system very quickly and very efficiently. And coming back to that bug they, uh, with the time zone and setting the word inherit as the time zone, that was actually a result of our work to inherit uh, time zones slightly differently. The UI used to set it to the local browser's time zone. And a lot of you guys are deploying to locations where you're not actually in the same time zone as where you maybe are deploying or any number of other situations. So by request of the community, we've actually uh, reverted that so that the time zones are no longer set uh, at any level uh, and they inherit it's starting at the account, the user, the device, looking for where it might be set, and then spilling over into the system default so that you don't have to set them every single time you create a voicemail box a, a user and those types of things. And we've been doing a lot of work, too, with uh, click-to-call and quick-call. Uh, one of the more interesting things that we've done there is the API now returns you a lot of information about the call ID and other aspects of the click-to-call that you just generated, which lets you, coming back to the Konami codes, do real-time manipulation of that call, for instance, or find it perhaps in a CDR. It gives you a lot, a lot more capabilities uh, programmatically to do interesting things there. So let's talk about Kazoo version 4.0. So there's a couple, uh, I think, four pillars here uh, of what 4.0 is going to be. Uh, so the first one is something that we've been working on for a long time. It's a little bit tricky to get right, uh, and it's probably not the best name for it, but we've been calling it the historical transactions. This, that's what name stuck. Uh, what this does is any time that a, a billable service is modified, we actually store a record of that modification and who made it and what the change was in both the account and the reseller's account, which lets you go in and see why you were billed for certain things, both at the reseller level and the account level. And so this will give you the ability to run reports. 
saying, oh, I see that George changed and added a new device to the sub-account, and that's what caused the spillover to, you know, that transaction on the 4th of May or something like that. We're also going to move where the registrations are resolved. So this one is, at the moment, when we build an invite string in FreeSwitch, we actually put the, the intended endpoint destination on the invite, and then we use the route header, of course, to send it off to Camilio, who simply proxies it off. What we're going to change here is we will use the username at domain on the invite, as kind of is intended. When it comes into Camilio, Camilio will then resolve the contact string and forward it off. Uh, and this fixes uh, a couple known issues with uh, tags and things like that, which aren't stored in the registrar, um, so that WebSockets, uh, TLS, um, and some of the, uh, the other phones that have additional parameters on there uh, work um, don't have any issues whatsoever with those headers being manipulated because they're just added and sent out. It also means that all we have to do is send it to the correct Camellio server, and there's never a race condition of was it the well, there's Camellio has already solved that problem. There's no race condition of is it still in flight on the message bus for the new registration and the port changed, and now we're going to get a you know, uh, uh, yeah, it's not going to work. <laughs> um, so this is, uh, and it also gives us some performance because, of course, we no longer need to do these lookups. All we need to know is which uh, Camellio server to send it to as well. And if you register to multiple zones, then it, we're just going to use the latest Camellio. It'll have the latest registration. Uh, there's also a uh, pull request currently pending, and that one is the Kazoo Number Manager Rewrite. So the Kazoo Number Manager Rewrite um, is moving um, into a more modular system in there. It's something that I hinted at last year uh, with uh, regards to being able to support lib phone number, uh, the Google library. Um, so the initial rewrite right now is fixing an issue. Uh, there's a phone numbers document, and I think I might have mentioned this last year, but it stores all of the numbers associated with an account on one document. And that's a significant pain point. It's what makes the number manager so slow. And it also limits the total numbers that you can assign to an account before you run into an issue. For instance, if you try to put 500 numbers on one account, uh, then you're going to have 500 numbers on this one document, and it's very slow to process on the order of seconds. So part of the Kazoo number manager rewrite is to store those numbers in the pointer numbers. These are not used for routing, by the way. But the pointer numbers as um, individual documents in, in the account database and using views to aggregate them together. And then we can paginate and do other operations against them. And because they're individual number documents, it's easy to go in if you remove the number, delete the document, things of that nature. So it, that will enable you guys to create accounts that have hundreds of thousands of numbers, at least in theory, if not more. Um, it also, while we're at it, we are normalizing some of the code base, uh, learning from our lessons. Uh, the current whistle number manager is a considerably old core library, uh, and there's some other optimizations that we've learned in the past uh, where we can make improvements to reduce some of the queries that are required in order to do the operations that it performs. Um, and also abstracting the number manager components internally into various uh, modules will also allow us to break up some of the things like WNM underscore number, which is a monster of business logic, which is difficult to maintain, and give us the ability to put unit tests and proper tests on these things. Uh, like I say, as we go through and do these modifications, we're adding more unit tests to keep the quality there. Another big one uh, is storing the voicemails, the voicemail messages in the month-only databases. So what we would like to do is move the storage of the voicemail metadata and the media, I'm sorry, not, yeah, the media document into the month-only database. And that will mean that there are no modifications going into your config databases uh, except for changes you know, to the configuration through the UI. So those databases, the configuration, the account databases will remain stable. The month-only databases will then be able to uh, store all the voicemails. And it, when we do that, uh, we'll use the metadata on the media document in order to track which mailbox it belongs to. So we won't have to continuously modify the VM box document, which will give us the ability to very easily have voicemail messages that belong to multiple mailboxes. We'll be able to recover metadata if there is some issue. If you needed to restore a voicemail box, simply moving the folder name will just have it show back up in the metal, metadata again. Um, and it also means that with the voicemail messages in the MODB, those can be rotated out, archived, and the, the, they are not stored forever in the, well, not forever, but they're, they're separate from the system database. Uh, so theoretically, you could store them on an archival server forever. Um, and the, uh, it gives you uh, increased scalability with regards to that. 
And the last one here is the Kazoo Couch Manager. Uh, so this one is, uh, we use a library called Couchbeam, uh, which underpins the interface that we, uh, the communication that we make with Couch. Uh, there's lots of improvements that we can actually uh, make at this time based uh, on removing that library, which will give us a quite a significant performance increase. But the other aspect of this is we can add, at the same time, connection pools that manage multiple Big Couch clusters. So what this would let us do is it would give us the ability to write rules saying things like those MODBs are now on this Big Couch cluster, and these config account databases are on this config cluster, and my archive is over on this Big Couch cluster. And you can start to split up your Big Couch clusters, uh, or perhaps even based on services. These are my premium customers, those are not. Uh, things of that nature, for instance. So this will give us a lot of flexibility in where that data is stored, lets you start to uh, break those and, and start giving you some archival options, as well as because those can, account databases won't grow anymore, they'll be stable when the MODBs aren't there, then you can actually um, have services that, prov that you can scale, and then your config cluster that is just the rock solid, really nice hardware uh, to ensure that you have 100% uptime. So what to expect, like I was saying, um, with the couch manager changes, uh, the database, all the database operations, we expect them to be much quicker. Uh, we've done some, some initial testing, and, and we believe that there'll be a significant performance increase by removing Couchbeam. Obviously, with the phone numbers uh, document move, you'll be able to store thousands or hundreds of thousands of voicemail, uh, phone numbers in a single account. Moving the voicemails gives us an easy path for additional features which you guys have been asking about in the voicemail uh, system, as well as allowing us to store those efficiently and elegantly and perhaps archiving them forever outside of your account databases. And these are the last major things in giving you a turnkey system that scales to hundreds of thousands of endpoints and beyond without having to know how to tweak the, the various parameters to overcome, like, for instance, the phone numbers document when you run into that if you're building that kind of a system. So this really is, like Darren was saying before, closing the last gaps that are in the core library and allowing us to really focus on the, feature co uh, the features and uh, the community contrib uh, contributions and requests that, are, that we're receiving. So that's my presentation. Thank you very much, guys.